Good evening, and welcome to Thinking Thursday. It's October 1st, beginning of another month, almost the end of 2020. A lot of people have been looking forward to the end of 2020. Well, it is winding down, but I've been saying, let's not just say 2020 be over. Let's say let's have a better 2021, because it could be over, and 2021 could come in with a bigger storm than 2020. So my wish is... Oh, yeah, we can. This 2020 vision is quite a vision, but let's let 2021 be awesome. So, welcome tonight to Thinking Thursday. I'm not going to tell you the topic yet. We're going to talk a little about October and we're going to get some breathing in and then we'll get started. So, if you're on, I encourage you to share the video. Go below the screen and you'll see the word share. Click on share so you can invite others in to enjoy this experience. I will tell you, we will be talking about suicide and suicide prevention, but it's something that people need to hear about. We don't talk about it, and you may share with someone who is struggling or someone who knows someone who's struggling, so share. It could be a benefit. So as always, we start off breathing. Why? For those of you who are here for the first time, Breathing helps get more oxygen to your brain. It helps you think more clearly. It calms your body down. Yes, we know how to breathe. We do it every day. But we breathe right here. We don't take in full, deep, cleansing breaths. So we're going to take a moment to practice taking in some full, deep, cleansing breaths. We're going to breathe into the count of four very slowly and breathe out to the count of four. So breathe in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. One more, in, two, three, four. Out, two, three, four. So hopefully you've had that Wusa moment and cleared your mind and you're ready to sit back, listen, and hopefully respond as well. <clears throat> so as I said, we are, we will be talking about suicide and suicide prevention. And yes, it's real in the African American community. So that's going to be our topic tonight. But as we enter October... We know that October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we will be addressing that later in the month. It is also Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we will address that later in the month. And I just had to add this last one. It's the best month of the year because it's my birth month. So yes, October, great month, great month, great month. So... These are the things we won't be dealing with my birthday, but uh, it does happen to fall on a Thursday, so we'll see about that. But these are things we will talk about later in the month, and I will have some guests on who will um, talk about these issues. With regards to domestic violence, I have someone who has overcome a very abusive relationship, not so much physical, but all the other things that go into domestic violence, and someone who was a perpetrator of domestic violence. And that person's not here to defend their actions, but to talk about what it's like to be that kind of person. So these are some things we have coming up for the month of October. But tonight, we are talking about suicide in the African American community. Now at first, when you hear it, it is not the most upbeat topic. However, it is a topic that is real and a topic that impacts our community. So I want us to address that. So um, I want you to think about for a moment, are there people in your life, um, what do you think just about suicide? Are there people in your life that um, struggle with this? Hmm, we're gonna find out. But as we get started, just drop a hello, drop a line in. Hello to my sister, yes, she know it's my birthday, yes. Drop a line in. Drop a hello. How are you feeling today? Was this a good day? A bad day? Hi, Denise. I see you're on. 
So just drop a line in if you'd like to. So tonight, we've got a question for you. It's a true or false question to get, start, uh, get started. Is it rare that African Americans commit suicide? Think about your answer. Is it rare that African Americans commit suicide? And the answer is false. It says it is rare, rather. It's false. And unfortunately, it's false. And we're going to look at some alarming statistics about suicide. Um, as we go into that, hello, Kenetra. She says, hello, everybody. The Lord has been good, has made good and she i've been planning to check with her she has see how she survived her first week of teaching virtually in person and online um so let's look at some things about suicide and this is a reminder i put this in here hit the share button on facebook uh why there may be someone as i said earlier who is thinking about suicide and going to talk to you about knowing how to know and maybe something can be said tonight to make them think or let those around them know how to be aware so hit the share button <clears throat> so let's look at some of those alarming statistics i just want to give you some numbers first to start out with to put it in perspective these are just suicide rates for black populations in the united states from 2009 to 2018 that bottom line that's us it's going up. If you look at overall rates in the U.S., they're higher, but man, we're mirroring. We are mirroring that. They're going higher and higher. And this is per 100,000. And to say, well, okay, five, in 2009, five or six people per 100,000 committed suicide. In 2018, it's around seven or eight. You might not think that's a lot, but that's a lot. And the fact that it's going up, not a good thing. And this just looks at by ethnicity. Now, by ethnicity, we're at the bottom. We don't commit suicide as at larger rates as other ethnic groups, but we're still rising. And that's the really important thing to know. We are still rising. Um, and in some age categories, we're going to find out we're surpassing. <coughs> This is just a breakdown of suicide rates by age. If you look, and there's an alarming statistic that there is even a number for 5 to 14-year-olds. Um, and our 5 to 14-year-olds are pretty much even with the national um, statistics for 14, 5 to 14-year-olds. And in 2017, they surpassed the national average. Um, 15 to 24 year olds if, um, <clears throat> at a high rate of suicide. Our lowest, interestingly enough, our lowest suicide rates in African American population are between the ages of really 55 to 80. It starts going down. We climb up between 15 to 24, our rates are pretty high. Between 25 to 34, our rates are high. At age 35, it starts to go down, and it goes down as we age. Maybe we get more mellow, I don't know. Maybe we begin to see what we have survived and know that we can survive. <clears throat> so we'll just see. Looking at the death rate, Males have a higher rate of um, death by suicide, a much higher rate than females, and I mean African Americans. Uh, overall, males have a higher rate than females, but you look in our population, African American males have a much higher rate of suicide. And the African American male rate, when you separate it out, is higher than, um, is, um, it's just, off the chain. It makes no sense. Well, when you think about everything going on in the world, you can understand. And what's really concerning is when you look at age, younger African Americans die at a higher suicide rate than older, Af uh, older African Americans. So that means when you pull it out and keep pulling it out, younger African American males are committing suicide at an extremely high rate. What does that do for us for just a population? that our younger males are killing themselves. Something to think about. 
the last thing on just looking at the numbers. In 2017, the suicide, uh, suicide was the second leading cause of death for African Americans ages 15 to 24. By 1991, uh, between 1991 and 2017, suicide attempts uh, among black adolescents increased 73%. There was a 73% increase in suicide attempts in African Americans between 15 and 24. That's high school and college. 73% increase. And guess what? In that same time frame, interestingly enough, in the white population, that same age group, their numbers went down. Um, according to an analysis, more than uh, 198,000 high school students um, were included in this study to get these statistics. And they looked at suicides and suicide attempts, but ours went up 73%. Now, the overall suicide rate for African Americans is about 60% lower than that of non-Hispanic white population. Just because we're 60% lower doesn't mean ours is still not of concern, because it is. African American females, grades 9 through 12, were 70% more likely to attempt suicide in 2017 as compared to their white counterparts. 70% higher, and that's part of that 73% increase. So our high school females are stressed out. And you think about it, during high school, you know, your world is magnified. The good is better than it ever is, and the bad is worse than it ever could be. But suicide, an option, just looking at the numbers, it's not a pretty thing. So I want to look at what are some risk factors that are specific to us. There are risk factors for um, suicide, but man, what things impact us? Um, we can be impacted by any of them, and there are quite a few lists. I picked 10 or 11 things for us to look at. Family violence, including physical or um, sexual abuse. Just being in the home. It might not be the person who's being abused. It could be the child in the home who sees this. So if you're in a home where there's physical violence, sexual abuse going on of that child or of others, they are seeing things go on, that's actually a risk factor for suicide. If you're the child and you're sitting here and you're watching, um, you see all this go on, you don't know what to do. You don't know how to take it. Those That becomes a risk, risk factor. Because it's something you, it's so far out of control for you, you don't know what to do. You feel helpless. And being helpless and feeling hopeless, hopeless are part of risk factors. And if you feel like there is no safety, you can see why that would be a risk factor. Lack of access to behavioral health care. Um, mental health issues, mental wellness issues are risk factors for suicide. As a community, we don't have the same access to behavioral health care. We don't have the same access to any kind of health care. Behavioral health is already at the bottom. Insurance companies view it differently. So you don't have the access. And there's still the stigma about receiving any kind of mental health, health care because, oh, just pray about it. Don't worry about it. We don't want to deal with any aspects of behavioral health. So we don't want to deal with it, and there's not the access easy, so it's harder to go get. And because it's harder to seek out, we just don't get it. Chronic disease and disability. Those are, those are other risk factors. Um, and there are certain diseases that, you know, you feel helpless and hopeless when you have this. You feel like you can't, um, you just can't overcome it. You want to give up because it's too hard to fight. And I already said, it's not just access to behavioral health care, it's access to health care. One of the reasons that we die quicker from disease and we get diagnosed at later stages is because of our access to health care, because we just don't go get it, and by the time we go in, uh, we may be treated differently because we are African American and we aren't listened to the same way, so we get pushed further back down the road, and 
then we're further down the road and we're more sick than we need to be. And those chronic diseases take us on and all of that. Risk factors. Depression and other mental health issues. When people are depressed in that moment, you feel helpless, you feel hopeless, you feel like you can't do anything. It can, Nothing can happen for you. It just won't work. So you want to give up. Someone I know said that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Because whatever is going on, this too shall pass. And you know what? That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get better. It just means that issue is going to pass. You may end up with another one that is worse. You may end up with another one and life is much better. But it's a permanent solution to something that will eventually pass. Knowing someone who died by suicide, particularly a family member, because one of the things that does, it puts in your mind, it, it lets you know that, oh, that's an option. Or you can feel so bad that you didn't help them, you weren't there, that you want to join them, so to speak. But, yes, just knowing someone or having someone in your family who has committed suicide can be a risk factor. Substance abuse. You know, people will use various drugs because it may, you know, it's self-medicated. It makes you think that you're getting rid of your problems. You're going to feel better if you are not, you know, if you're high. While I'm high, I'm not thinking about it. But when you come down, you can come down lower. And that up and down can be another push toward um, suicide, simply using Having access to lethal means. You know, we were talking about family violence in the home on the first bullet point. Um, having guns in the house. If I am thinking about suicide and there are things in the house that I can use. And you know what? We have lethal means in our houses, whether we think about it. having knives, that beautiful butcher block set of knives, that could be a lethal weapon. So if you know someone who is thinking about suicide, that butcher block set of knives doesn't need to sit out. Um, so lethal weapon, lethal things, the, your pill case, your medications that you may have. Maybe you are older and have lots of medication, or maybe you've just had some issues and you're not even older and you have medications around. That could be a lethal mean for, means for someone who is contemplating suicide. So we think of the gun, we think of the knives, but man, if you look at your house, you have other things that you may not even be aware of that you should. So if you are in a situation where you are living with someone and you know, man, I think they're thinking about suicide, you want to not have so many lethal things around. You want to consider lethality in a different way and think, well, I need to move a lot of stuff. Maybe you do. Social isolation is a risk factor for suicide. You think about this time we're in with coronavirus. Man, there are some people that are still just isolated because they're older and they don't want to go out because they know they're at an at-risk. Uh, they're in an at-risk population, so their kids aren't coming to see them. They're um, not going to church. They're not going to play bingo. They're not going to their senior citizens group because none of these things are meeting. So even if they wanted to go, they can't. So that social isol isolation can really kick in. Even we talked before about younger people who are experiencing social isolation. They've been home, going to school. Our middle and high school kids, parents got to go to work. They leave them. They're old enough. They stay home. But, man, they're still home, and they're dealing with this isolation. So anyone who has any of the other risk factors, maybe they have some mental illness, maybe there's some depression already going on, and now you're in the house alone for a long period of time. So if you know someone, even if they were great before this social isolation and they're older and they're home, check on them. Check on them regularly. Oh, well, they would never commit suicide. I'm not saying they would, but I'm saying, boy, you need to check on people who are um, home, alone, at any age, and make sure they're okay. Stress resulting from prejudice and discrimination. Let me read you uh, a quote 
that was printed in the Journal of Psychiatry in 1921. Um, because back then, it was believed and reported in scholarly journals that we couldn't deal, we didn't have depression or mental health issues. Um, here is the quote. Most of the race are carefree, live in the here and now with limited capacity to recall or profit by experiences of the past. Sadness and depression have little part in his psychological makeup. I'm going to read that last quote, the last line. Sadness and depression have little part in his psychological makeup. And this is the American Journal of Psychiatry in 1921. So it was, they were taught that, oh, you know, black people, they don't get depressed. It's not part of their makeup. When you stop and think about it, it's totally inaccurate, totally antithetical to anything that happened to us. Suicide was very common among slaves. Uh, when they were captured, many willingly jumped over the boat because to be jumped out of the boat because to be captured and to be in this existence, whatever it was going to be, death was better. Suicide has been a part of our existence as African Americans since we first were captured and bought over here in the enslaved period. So it's real, but you know what? We've bought into that um, psychological view that was put forth in 1921, that was taught. We believed it. No, we, we, that's not us. And that goes back to that historical trauma. You know, we've talked about trauma before and how the um, trauma is passed down from generation to generation and these things happen. The historical trauma that we have faced and still faced, the genetic markers that are imprinted upon our DNA lend themselves to us feeling um, feeling like there's trauma. Once a person tries, there is an attempt made, they're, they're much, at a much higher risk for completing suicide at a later date. What happens is, you know, you think, okay, they tried it, we got them help, they're doing good, they know how to mask it more, but once you have that one try, you're at a greater risk um, for this happening. Um, someone said that grief can be a trigger too because grief can cause depression. And that is part of the stages of grief and you can move through them. But when you're there in that moment and there is no help, there is no support, yes, that can be, um, that can be a big trigger. In 1921, there was Red Summer in Houston and it was um, two years um let me see, it was 1921 was Red Summer, and this is what someone is putting in. They remember the quote, before I be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave. And that mentality went on through slavery. Before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my, in my grave. So suicide has been something that we have known and has been a part of our um, existence since the beginning of this country. Now, you know, I like to give you the facts, and the facts aren't always pretty. But then I want to go and, okay, so where do we go with this? <coughs> what can I do? So we're going to talk about, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> how can I help? First off, um, just know, if, if it's you or if it's someone out there that you know who is um, experiencing any of these risk factors, violence in the family, physical abuse, sexual abuse, <clears throat> depression, some other chronic disease. They don't have access to health care, behavior, or otherwise. They know someone who committed suicide. They are depressed. They have other mental health issues going on. They're using any kind of drugs or alcohol. They have guns and knives around them. They are isolated. <clears throat> They are just black in America dealing with stress and prejudice, discrimination, and historical trauma. Anybody you know um, have any of these issues, here are some things to do. And Denise 
commented on how grief can be a trigger. That's why we offer Grief Share. And um, Denise is a member of New Life Fellowship in Arlington, and they have Grief Share classes. And even through COVID, the classes are offered um, virtually. Um, and it is an awesome program. It allows you to process grief. And there it may be one in your area. If you're not in this area, but now it's virtual, you can still be a part of it. But Grief Share, and there are different grief organizations that are there because, yes, grief can definitely be a trigger to suicide. So thank you both. So look, let's look at some things on how can I help. And the first thing is be willing to talk. Some people think that, well, you know, if we talk about suicide, that might make the person want to commit it. We're going to plant that seed. And especially when it comes to talking to kids, we would never ask a child. You can't ask, yeah, I know they're depressed, but if I ask them if they've ever thought about killing themselves, they're going to go do it. That's a real thought. I hope it sounds ridiculous to you. Because it is. Just talking about it is not going to make a person go out and do it. If if you are feeling really deeply that they are too depressed, they need to get some help, you need to get them some help. If you don't want to ask them, let the trained professional talk to them about, man, how are you really feeling? And I will tell you, as a trained professional, I don't really like asking people that, but boy, I will ask in a minute because I need to know. I'm here to help you uh, become better, uh, achieve better mental health. So if that's something you're dealing with, yes, I will ask. Or if you are just feeling down, if you come to session and you seem extra depressed, I will ask. When I was younger in the field, it was, just, it was something I wasn't comfortable asking. I will ask in a minute because I need to know. need to be able to help you. Be willing to listen. Listen with your ears, but most importantly, listen with your heart. So let's look at some ways to um, listen. When you're listening and you're listening and looking for the warning signs. So here they are. When people are talking about wanting to die. You know, life is just, it's just bad. <sighs> it's, it, I can't take it anymore. When you hear that, don't take that for granted. When you hear people saying, talking about killing themselves, take them seriously. Another fallacy is people say that, oh, they're just saying that to get attention. Well, I'll say, okay, if that's true, and someone goes to that much extreme to get attention, there's still a problem. I'm going to kill myself. Oh, I'm just kidding. Hmm. Take it seriously if someone says that. When someone says they're feeling empty or hopeless or don't have a reason to live, believe them. Maybe you're going to be that reason. I was talking with some someone today, and they said, oh, talking doesn't help. I said, why do you say that? I'm just telling you, I know. I said, but you're still here. You have felt suicidal, but you're here. Well, you know, I made promises. Mm, you spoke to someone and made those promises, and you're still here. So, yes, talking does help. You may be the link that somebody says okay I promise you one of the things in therapy you will have people do sometimes is do a suicide contract a no harm contract that they put in writing that they won't do anything for the next it might be the next day it might be the next week but they you get them to commit and you'd be surprised sometimes having them commit to doing that it gives you time to get them more help it gives them time to think but you take it seriously. Saying that I am suicidal is real. Believe it. And that's when you listen with your heart. And if they say it and they're smiling, they're like, oh, no, I'm just kidding. That's such a serious thing to say. You wouldn't want to let it go. Um, let's say a person is just saying, maybe they're even saying, they're not saying, oh, no, I'm not suicidal, but I don't see any reason to live. What that is saying, I might not want to actively kill myself, but I don't want to live. And the part you want to hold on to is the, I don't want to live. So in that moment, there is still hope. I don't want to kill myself. 
I'm not going to do it. I don't want to die. I don't want to kill myself. But I don't want to live. So they're torn between those two. And right now, the I don't want to kill myself is bigger than I don't want to live. But at any point, it could switch over. So when you hear those things, you have to take seriously. Some other things to hear with your heart. Someone saying, I feel trapped. I'm just trapped in this world. I'm trapped with bad things happening. Nothing good is, nothing is going right in my life. I'm tra- I can't move. Whatever, I don't know how to think. I don't know how to move from point A to point B. There is no point B. I am trapped. If someone's feeling that trapped, that's another time for you to need to step in. Listen with your heart and get them help. Or what if they're feeling, but there are no solutions. There's nothing you can do to help me. Nothing you can say or do to make things better. That's the ultimate hopelessness. Nothing's going to, it can't be better. Be that person. Or they feel like they're a burden to others. You know what? I'm, I'm just no good where I am now. And I'm just a burden to everybody. So it probably would be better if I'm, I'm just gone. I just need to be gone and be out of the way. So they haven't said I wanted to, I want to take my life. They haven't said I'm suicidal. But they're saying I'm a burden to everybody. And it would be better if I was gone. Just hearing those words. Hmm. Listen with your heart. <clears throat> be willing to observe. These are some signs and things you may see. If you notice someone researching ways to take their life, ways to commit suicide, you need to take this seriously and have that you just stumble up there on their phone and they're playing and you know you have to look. Why are you looking up suicide? Oh. Uh, it was just interesting to me. It was just interesting. And if this same person has been depressed, you might need to worry. Now, if you ever look at my search, I need to really delete my history. It would probably look crazy because I researched suicide. I researched depression. Things I'm going to talk about to you guys. I'm, I'm reading scholarly articles. I'm reading all this. So my search history, if somebody like me, you might be okay with it. Because if you looked at my search history this week, you're going to see a lot of stuff about suicide. I'm good. But if you see people routinely researching ways to take their life, creative ways to take their life, ways to take your life so no one will uh, know, then you need to listen with your heart and look with, uh, look with your heart and see. When they start stockpiling pills are obtaining potential lethal items. They're suddenly interested in guns or knives. I once worked with someone who, um, this was a child, they secretly ordered knives off the internet. I felt that was a red flag, and it was. So when people begin to, or maybe they're just saving pills up and saving pills up um, so that they can you know, take a lethal dose, buy a new gun, knives, or find other creative, or find poison. If they're, again, on the internet, maybe they're researching and they find a certain kind of poison is lethal quickly, and they buy that. So, you know, just being what's wrong, because there are, there are a lot of ways and a lot of things that are legal, and you can just go buy. Maybe you can buy a little here. You know, on the internet, I'll buy some over here. I buy some over here. I buy some over here. And pretty soon I have enough of what I need. I'm only getting a little. And I'm getting it from different sources. And, you know, now the people can be creative. And I'll use this name to buy it over here. I'll use this name to buy it over here. And you're not, you know, no one really tracks it. <clears throat> if someone's been involved with family and friends and they back up and they're starting to shut people out they don't want um i don't need to see anybody they're just backing up from people that's a sign if you have friends and we talked about that isolation right now where people are isolated because they're not physically going anywhere but then they stop taking your phone calls and it's like well you're stuck in the house don't you want to talk well let's let's facetime let's um zoom oh no i'm good i just want to talk i'm, I'm real good I'm I'm just tired today and people continue to back away and withdraw not good. 
Um, when people give away important possessions, you know what? I was thinking of you, and I want you to have this. That could be great. It could simply be someone really thinking about you. You know, this is important to me. This is my mother's brooch. I always loved it. I want you to have it. I was thinking about you, and I want you to have it. That might be a good thing, but you need to see. Are they trying to give away things that are important as a way of saying goodbye, as a way of saying you're important to me? So you need to think about that. Or if they're calling, sometimes somebody who's suicidal will call to say goodbye. Now, they may not say, I'm getting ready to kill myself in the next two days, so I'm saying goodbye. But, you know, I just wanted to talk to you one last time. So you're listening for those kind of things. So if, um, if you know someone's depressed already, you need to listen to those kinds of things. Now, I just want to talk to you one last time. So you hear that phrase, one last time. What do you mean, one last time? I'll talk to you tomorrow. Well, maybe. And so you begin to listen. And so are they saying goodbye to you? You don't know. If someone is displaying extreme mood swings, suddenly changing from very sad to very calm and happy, here's something that people often overlook. Someone who's been depressed for a long time, <clears throat> and, they, you know, and they've been talking about suicide, and you've been trying to help them, but maybe they haven't gotten any professional help, or maybe they have, but they're in this zone of talking about suicide and they're really there and they're extremely depressed and suddenly they're just life is wonderful they're calm they're smiling you know just yesterday they were really depressed you might think oh well that's good they're feeling better it could be just the opposite it could be that they're at the point where i'm done i have made peace with this i'm done and I'm happy because I'm done. So just that quick turnaround does not necessarily mean that everything is better. Um, so you need to think about that. Well, I will show you this. There is um, a suicide hotline. As I said, this is su September. We're a day short. It's Suicide Prevention Month. I want to leave the number up, but I'll say it for those who may be listening and not watching. It is one 800 Two seven three eight two five five, and I'll repeat it again in a minute, and I'll leave it up on the screen for a while for those who are watching. Um, it's important to know that there is help out there. So, what about those in the religious community, the church community? Where does suicide fit in all of this? <clears throat> I wanted to talk about that for a minute. Because there are some studies that say some interesting things. I told you, if you do my search history, you'll see a lot in there. So there was a study, and I wanted to read a quote from it, um, about um, teens. This particular study dealt with teens. And it said most of the research looks at um, suicidal behaviors and in, um, in looks at risk factors. But what are some preventative things? And this particular study, and it was done by African Americans, decided to examine the strength of the African American community. Um, and we can talk about all the negatives, but there's a lot of strength in the African American community that we can bring to each other in a very positive way. And that particular strength can be uh, a preventative measure. When looking at the church, here's a quote I'm going to read. Religious coping buffered against suicide risk in a community based sample of African American adolescents. Their findings that hopelessness and depression were risk factors for suicidal thoughts and behavior cor corroborated the general literature on suicide in adolescents. However, they found <clears throat> that African American adolescents who used collaborative religious coping mechanisms, the individual and God worked together to solve problems, were more likely to attend church were more likely to be active in church, which tended to feel less hopeless and reported more reasons for wanting to live than did African-American adolescents who used um, non-religious coping styles. And so basically, it is probably the structure of the church giving that positive community 
and an environment that perpetuates hope as opposed even in a time of hopelessness that can be a protective factor um it said it contrasts to those with african-american teens who were self-directed and had no religious coping styles they were more likely to uh, experience more hopelessness <clears throat> so it is not you know it's not that going to church is going to keep you from committing suicide but going to church and having the sense of hopefulness as opposed to hopelessness being around a positive community having a faith in god believing that god is going to be there to protect you and god's going to be there even though life stinks right now having a belief in something greater than yourself and greater than your situation could be the saving factor um and so that's an important issue to consider that is something um I was trying to see if there was one other quote. Um, last thing I want to say, I meant to say it earlier, but I still bring it up. When looking at issues of mental health and suicide, white children with behavioral problems such as irritability and belligerence were often diagnosed with mood disorders, while black children exhibiting the exact same behaviors are seen as disruptive and requiring discipline. How does that fit in with suicide? If your issues of mental health, irritability, acting out, is seen as something we can fix because it's a problem, as opposed to seeing that you are the problem. When you are the problem, that's going to give you that sense of hopelessness, helplessness, and can lead to thoughts of suicide. So how we allow others to define our children can be very important. So it's important that we remember that um, suicide's real. Our children can fall prey to that. We can at any age. And remember, as a people, it's been a part of who we are since we've been here in this country. I wanted to repeat the suicide prevention line again. It is 1-800-273. 8255. Five. So if that is something that, um, if that's something you've been thinking about or something you just think someone you know is dealing with, talk to them. Get them help. If you don't want to ask because that's just, I can't ask anybody that. Mm. As Eugene says, the life you save may be the one you love. So be willing to ask the hard questions. If they get upset with you, they probably you probably said something they needed to hear so reach out and ask you know I now like to end with my call to action my call to action this month has changed except for the first one register to vote and become an educated voter you have a few days left in Texas to become a registered voter but don't just register become an educated voter we talked before that it used to be that um, you could go and I'm just going to vote a party line, be it Republican or Democrat. In Texas, you don't have that option. So if that was your option, you need to know name by name. And don't just know name by name. You can go to the League of Women Voters and you can find a voter's guide. This voter's guide, has they've interviewed everyone running and they ask them the same questions. You can compare candidate A to candidate B and look at their answers. What works for you? So become an educated voter. And I always say, don't just vote for one thing. You need to vote not just for president, but down ballot. Because that person who you're voting for locally is going to have an impact on your life. During this election, do something tangible to promote your candidate. I am, if it's not your candidate, help someone else. Um, I am doing a postcard drive, helping some with a, someone with a postcard drive where we're, you hand write postcards, and as you do that, you mail them out. Maybe you, you know, now you might not want to go door knocking, so maybe that's a way. But do something tangible. Don't just say, be a good voter, be educated. You do something to take the initiative to help others vote. And lastly, ladies, if you have not had a mammogram in a while, plan to get one. Gentlemen, get your ladies out there. However, I will say, and we'll talk about this a little bit, 
Some people don't realize that men can get breast cancer as well. So we'll spend some time as we're talking about that. We'll dedicate a little time to that. Of course, the numbers are smaller, but we want to put that out there as well. But, um, you know, I want to reach out to everybody. And this is Bronwyn Lucas with ABLE Counseling and Consulting, where we affirm, build, lead, and empower you. If you find yourself in a situation where life is overwhelming, please reach out. If I'm not the therapist you want to work with, I will help you find someone. But I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you're feeling helpless, hopeless, like there's no way out, or you know someone who is feeling that way, my number is 682-272-3949. I'm here to help. I take insurance and private pay, and I love what I do. So thank you guys for listening in tonight. And as I like to say, mental health is just your health. It's all health. So happy mental health. See you next week.